as a company, we've developed a, a set of products that are all kind of geared towards this. Um, and you can see them here. Uh, we have Julia Pro, which I think some of you at least are already using, uh, which is our, our integrated development environment. Uh, we have Julia Shore, which gives ads in support and indemnity. And what I'm going to be talking about today is Julia Team, which adds on capability for enterprise governance and collaboration, allowing you to easily work together um, within your firewall, get everybody up and running with Julia uh, without any trouble. And um, then we also have that connecting in with a deployment piece we call Julia Run that allows you to connect either to your own internal cluster or to a cloud provider, uh, whatever your uh, infrastructure demands um, to, to deploy your code in parallel, uh, which is, is very easy. And I'll, I'll demonstrate a little bit of that as well. Um, so Julia Computing came to be because the creators of Julia, they were approached by companies saying, hey, we need commercial support here. Just being an open source project isn't enough. Uh, and so that's that's where the company came out of. Uh, we you know employ lots of the key contributors to both Julia itself as well as the ecosystem, and and are in lots of lots of places, uh, as you can see from all the logos on the slide here. Um, so I have there's lots more content on this slide, but I think in interest of time and to to honor you know what will be most useful to you guys let's just dive right into what julia team looks like and, and what it can provide for you um, so the idea behind julia team is that we install this um the server or software in your own network uh, it can also be cloud hosted but generally within companies we find that it works best to to put it directly in your you to install it directly in your network so that way it's behind your firewall uh, and can can work easily and and uh, you know meaningfully with your private data and private code. Uh, so as you can see here, it can even integrate in with your authentication services. I'm going to log in with email here uh, and uh, log in, so that way we can see what it looks like. So I've logged in as an administrator to this demo server now that demonstrates what Julia. And as an administrator, I get lots of options here that, you know, are, are going to be predominantly useful to your IT guys. Um, but as a, a, a Julia programmer, you're probably going to be most interested in things like documentation search, where you can uh, search documentation uh, for a certain technique um, or a, oops, I'm, XG boost. Uh, or a you know some some function some functionality that you're after and and this can you know search for search through your entire ecosystem that gives you exactly you know what you need and you know searches not only the public packages but also your private packages that you've registered and developed within your own team so this kind of gives gives developers the single point of reference for all your code, be it in the open source community or, or stuff that you've, you've developed yourselves. Um, and actually, there's a, a third option there, which is things from the open source community that you've ended uh, and made changes to and shared out with your own community, um, with your team members. And uh, those changes will show up here as well. So this will, will pull up documentation, bring everything in. And you can see here that even the documentation is hosted locally, this demo server. So you never need to leave your, your safe and secure network to, for example, check out documentation, uh, which is a huge, yeah. huge benefit. Um, you can also do code search, uh, which is really awesome because it inclu can include regular expressions. Uh, so you can, you know, search your code, uh, the entire code base of of everything. So this is frequently where where your end users will go to work with Julia and and get this going. You can also, for example, download Julia Pro directly from the server, so that way you don't need to again 
leave your firewall. Uh, everything is is set up here, just uh, set so that way uh, Julia Pro will connect to Julia Team and, and everything will work seamlessly. So on the IT governance side of things, the, the page that's going to be most useful there is this packages tab where you can look through every single registered package, not just within the open source community, uh, but also here we have a demo registry that we've added. And you can see that we've added three special packages here that aren't available in the open source environment, but are available locally to me uh, as a Julia team member. And you can see that all these packages here are enabled and ready to install. And in fact, some of them, you can see my someone on my team has actually gone out and installed them. Uh, so you can see what is installed. You can see licenses, versions, all of this information is right here at your fingertips to do. And importantly, what, what you may end up needing to do is, you know, make sure that the packages that your teams is, is using is, is, you know, satisfying the legal requirements of your company. So for example, lots of companies don't like using licenses that are AGPL3. This is, you know, a, a uh, an open source license that is fairly restrictive in terms of what companies can do with it. Uh, and so you can see there are very few packages uh, that are in the open source ecosystem that are registered with AGL GPL3, but there are a few. So what we can do here is we can actually go through and turn these guys off, make sure that nobody ever installs an AGPL uh, package and just by simply turning these things off may, means that nobody on my team will ever be able to install this. Um, and so this allows you to to very carefully you know monitor what what things your team is using, but also you know makes sure that uh, you are um, satisfying your legal requirements. So that is the packages and, and the kinds of things that you can do here. You can, of course, then you know filter out to, to find certain packages or uh, you know, look for specific things. Um, but this allows you to, to look through both, both the, the open source packages as well as your own packages. Now, when it comes to deployment, one of the things that you're going to, you know, that many folks want to do is, is build a package, register it as what we call an application, and set it up so that way you can easily deploy it to either your own internal cloud or, you know, an on-prem cluster uh, or AWS or Google or, or however, you know, works best for you. All of these things are possible. You can see here that we have these two applications registered uh, as part of our, um, you know, private code. Uh, you can see these are, are registered, and there's a little action button here that allows you to run this in the connected cloud to this Julia Team instance. And again, we'll set this up with you guys so that way it, it talks nicely to whatever you know. I, whatever computing environment you have uh, in terms of your resources on how you want to deploy your code. But this would be how you could run it in the cloud. You can see that by clicking that button, I've jumped down to this last page here, this Julia Run Cloud page that automatically has set up all the, what we call the project and manifest, this listing of dependencies, all the things that are required to jump into a reproducible environment and get all your workers set up to run this, this project. And, and I could submit this just as it is, but I find it a little bit more instructive instead of you know talking about some application that is relatively complicated, I find it a little more helpful to just you know run plain old Julia code. Uh, and this, this will uh, kind of be a fun exercise for those of you who are newer with Julia in terms of what Julia code looks like and how you can, can run it in parallel. Um, I have an example code here. Let me pull that up. Uh, here we go. Uh, let's see, let's look at it in here first. So let's make this bigger so that way we can see what we're doing. So this is my example code. 
really, really simple function. Uh, all I'm doing, I have this function named pi that takes a number of iterations. I have this special for loop here. Uh, it is a for loop that iterates over all the numbers from one to n, numbers that I gave it. Uh, and on each iteration, it picks out two random numbers. Then it tests to see if those two random numbers, if their square, the sum of the squares is less than or equal to one. Computation here is essentially asking, are these random numbers inside a circle or not? This is the, the equation for a circle, for those of you who uh, remember that from your geometry classes. Um, but what, exactly what we're doing here isn't terribly important. The, the important thing is, is that this general structure here is the structure of a Monte Carlo simulation, right? You'll do some random numbers, pick out some random numbers, do some computation with it, and come up with it with the result. So what we're doing here with this special at distributed thing in front of our for loop, that's doing essentially a parallel map reduce that executes this code and takes the sum of all of the results of, of this code, uh, stores it into a variable, does a little bit more arithmetic in it. And what you end up with, hopefully anyways, is an estimate for pi, a Monte Carlo estimate for pi by comparing the number of, of random points that landed inside the circle versus those that didn't. Um, so this is a very simple, simple function. All I do here is I define this function Thing, the, the distributed functionality. And then at the end here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show its value uh, and time how long it took to get that value back. Uh, so let's go back to Julia team here and let's paste that in. So I just copied and pasted it in here. And now you can see there's a bunch of options in terms of how I want to connect to my cluster, right? How I want to run this code. You can choose the number of workers, how much resources each worker should have. I'm just going to start off with two workers, uh, one CPU per worker and the minimum amount of memory for each worker, because this is a, a very trivial operation. But I think it's it's useful in, in that it's one that's hopefully understandable, even for folks that aren't very familiar with Julia's syntax. So now you can see here that we've submitted this. Uh, and if I look down at my my previous runs here, we have a currently running job and we can look at what its logs are. So let's bring this up. You can see here that uh, it does a little bit of preparation work. It waits for two workers to start up because that's how many workers I said we would use. It tells me, ah, okay, those workers got kicked off in eight seconds and now we're running our user code. Refresh this page. And sure enough, here's our estimate for pi, 3.1415. I think the next digit should be nine. So we're close, right? We're getting a nice estimate for pi here, which is pretty cool. And uh, it printed out how long it took, right? Because I had that special time macro to print out how much time it takes to do this. You can see it took about 20 seconds to get this estimate of pi. That's all right, but maybe we can do a little bit better. And so this is this work that it, it's you know completed its job, uh, and in a typical application, often what you'll do is instead of you know printing out the computation to a log file, store it in you know whatever distributed file system you're using, right? You would have this con connected in to to load your data, and then could also save back your results uh, in in a meaningful way for you guys. Um, but this this allows us to quickly and rapidly look at at what's going on. So let's go back here and let's just try increasing the number of workers, say to workers instead of two. So 10 times as many workers, hopefully we'll be able to get this job done a little bit faster than 20 seconds, right? So you can just change that one knob. I didn't change any code, right? I didn't need to change any code. This all is, is totally agnostic. It's just using the built-in distributed functionalities of Julia. Um, and so now you can see I have a new job running down here. I can click on its log. And now it's going to wait for 20 workers to kick off. In this case, we're connected to an AWS cloud, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, and so we actually have it set up to tear down workers if they're not being used. So I'm not sure if I'm going to have these 20 workers available immediately or not. We'll see. I, I, um, 
I did this earlier this morning and it took about two minutes to boot up the workers uh, if they had been torn down. Looks like we're gonna have to wait just a second for them to, to start back up. But you can see how this actually ends up saving you, you time, right? And, and money and that you don't have to have your server running. It'll automatically boot up the nodes as needed on demand uh, and tear them down after, after you're done. So for a simple calculation, like, you know, a 20 second com computation of pi, it feels a little silly to wait two minutes in order for your, uh, in order for your machines to start up. But I hope you can appreciate that in a, a real world situation, we'd be talking about a computation that might be taking, you know, tens of hours and to, to jump it up to 20, 20 workers. Well, you can drop your, your runtime down to, just an hour or two um, instead of tens of hours uh, and you know make use of all that parallelism. So let's see here. We're still still waiting for these guys to start up. Yeah, so anyways, here you can see that it took just over a hundred seconds to boot up these 20 workers and our computation of pi now not in 20 seconds, but in you know just over four seconds. So we did get a good amount of parallelism out of this guy. Uh, and you can see how how quickly it, that that completed um, and the 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 time that we spent waiting there was just time to to spin up the workers right that's a the con constant time and if i were to go back to julia team and, and resubmit this job i uh, those workers should still be active i believe i've waited too long here and it should take you know essentially very little time to to reconnect to them um and they'll uh that'll uh, be a, a bit quicker this way. Um, so that is is Julia team. And yeah, here you can see that it uh, only took 12 seconds now because these workers were already running. We've not torn them down yet. And so they're, it's, it's much quicker this way. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll start shooting <laughs> my quest, list of questions. So um, the, yeah, in the screen. In the application screen, uh, there's an ability to submit jobs over to our own cloud. That's right. right. Um, so how is that different from doing it versus Julia run cloud? Uh, this is exactly that. Uh, you click this and it, it sets up you, the Julia run cloud with these oh, okay. manifests in it. And by oh. default, It'll just essentially run whatever is in. Uh, it'll do, you know, like a, basically an include bin slash main dot jl. So whatever script is in that package, uh, it'll it'll run that for you. Uh, that's that's the way that this is set up to work. So is it your cloud or our cloud? I'm a little confused. It, I it is your cloud. We'll connect to your cloud. That's where you know in the administrator tab you can configure configure that how how you need to, to make sure that, you know, it's connecting either to, so it can connect either to AWS uh, or an on-prem cluster um, and we do both. 